them. Good. As my nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thank you for taking a minute. Where are you located? I'm right now in Amsterdam. Okay, wonderful. How's Amsterdam today? Uh, very rainy. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's great to meet you. And you know, before we get into the brand new album, you know, the one thing that's been very um, that that really kind of ravaged the artist community was living through COVID. The last three years, how did you get through it? And how has it changed the way that you do things now? So this is already part of the interview? Or oh, this just... oh, yeah, no, I was, I, I dive in. I kind of take the jazz lead. I just jump in. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Okay. Um, well, how it was, <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I lost my business. I lost all the gigs, the tour. Uh, yeah, basically existence. Yeah. Um, and it's part of why I'm kind of now in partially Amsterdam and then also Boston. Um, so I'm kind of in between worlds trying to figure out where I should be. <laughs> um, but it's definitely not back to normal. Um, a lot of people think like people who are not in the music business, they think like, well, but you know, there's concerts and, you know, I go to shows and, you know, there's things happening, but um, I mean, all the musicians and all the arts people, they know it's, it's never as it was before, unfortunately. And I think the reason is really also just because it takes so long to kind of um, to heal <laughs> from all of what's going on. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really, yeah, it's, it's a matter of time, hopefully, but it's also people got used to be inside and, you know, it's kind of comfy on the couch and there's so much anyway you can do from home. Um, I'm still positive and believe that music gives something that you cannot get that deeply and profoundly when you are there in person you know um i just had a great duo concert well actually two with um my dear pianist uh, maxim lubarski he came extra here for two shows and it's just it's incredible what it can do to yourself when you're in it and you're singing and playing music and then how do people react i mean it's very obvious to me that this this will continue in in one form or the other so yeah so how good does it feel to have a new album out now? Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, finally, you know, um, I was supposed to release that in 2020. Um, and then, yeah, we all know what happened. So it's really like three years later. Oh my God. You know, I, it, yeah, I, a lot of my artist friends, they, they were like, oh, just release it, just release it. I was like, yeah, it's this kind of baby that it's too precious to just give out like that. Um, and I'm glad I didn't do it. Um, I tried to reschedule the tour probably four times, actually. Um, and that didn't happen. So, um, yeah, now I just I did an online release and, you know, I got great reviews um, and another great one from Downbeat. Actually, an article about uh, me as an independent artist is coming out in the October issue. So it's, you know, it's nice. It's like I'm not sure if these things would have happened if I would have just rushed it either in 2020, 2021 or 2022. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about what the the title of this album means. Um, well, um, homage, homage, um, it's a dedication, sure. um, a memoir, so to say, to Gramlis. Gramlis is the name of the family farm I grew up on. Um, it's just an odd name. It doesn't really mean anything, but obviously it means everything to me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's a family farm where my parents were the farmers for the past 45 years. And uh, I grew up there my first 24 years of my life. And um, they had basically their dairy, like it was maybe 24 cows or so. So it's nothing compared to U.S. farm <laughs> with yeah. 300 or 500. You know, it's, it's small. It's cute. It's like there's apple trees, there's cherry trees, there's pear trees. You can walk from one tree to the other. You know, it's like and they're all like it's not like they're in a row or something. So it's actually, um, yeah, it, it's a different symmetry, let's say. Um, there's some chicken we had, like maybe 30, we had some pigs as well, we had goats, we had rabbits, so it's like, you know, a lot of animals that, not a lot, like, um, in terms of quantity, um, but, um, yeah, just many different kinds, and 
uh, they also had like a pet zoo where the neighbors basically from the community with their kids and families, they came and they, you know, enjoyed the, the farm life. Um, and they also taught classes on the farm, uh, for example, you know, from from grass to milk and that you don't just go into a Whole Foods or, or Star Market, whatever, and you just get your milk. It's actually, you know, from a cow and this is the process. And, you know, so I think a lot of um, young kids uh, don't even learn that anymore. Uh, where does the food come from? And I think growing up in such an environment with uh, being around like vegetables that actually come from soil and you know the fruits from the tree and the, the milk from the cows it's just it's pretty unbelievable when you have that chance to grow up that way and I think I'm still uh, to this day very conscious of my um, choice where I buy what and trying to support local farmers if it's possible uh, is always a bunch of question of course as well as a musician but um, it's it's really um, yeah it's it's very important to me and I think also um, yeah it uh, it would be great if more people would think that way. So talk to me about how you artistically put this album together. Um. Yeah, that was, I mean, it's kind of with the end, like I knew my parents are thinking about like how to wrap this period up, so to say, because, you know, they got older, um, financially it was not really, you know, it, they couldn't really do it anymore because it's just, uh, it's difficult as farmers. They didn't have helpers on the farm um, also because of that reason. And it was just really kind of like, okay, like they need to move forward with something. Um, and they stopped actually in 2018. And then I was really feeling like, wow. So if I would go home now to Switzerland, I don't have a home anymore. <laughs> this is insane. You know, that farm is gone um, and it, nobody knew what's going to happen with it. And, you know, I have siblings, but they didn't neither them or I wanted to take it over uh, because we all have different pro professions um, and yeah there was a big you know thing going on uh, with, with what's going to happen with the farm is another family coming and you know and that actually was a big voting in the community and with the state and everything so it turned out that the, the family um, uh, yeah m a new family basically moved in years later and the the whole house was renovated etc but to put this musically together like i think it started in my mind probably in 2016 17 and the reason was probably because i was starting to yodel um in boston i don't know why it just kind of came to me and i realized that there is something i have to look into deeper because this is not just um it's not just doing sounds with me. It's actually very emotional when I yodel. Um, and I kind of avoided that for many years because I was just like, well, okay. I mean, I'm studying jazz I'm, I'm I love funk. I love R&B, soul, whatever. Right. Um, and that's what I was singing all these years, but I also grew up yodeling and I kind of forgot about that because during teenage, it got like, more like embarrassing or something it's like well you know it's kind of yodeling <laughs> so um yeah and then I just tried to to fuse that somehow because I was like this is part of me I have to somehow put that into my compositions because it just makes sense but the process was definitely not an easy one and I, I still think to this day that not all tunes work <laughs> some work better than others um but again like the ones that I think they don't work some people were like no that's my favorite tune so yeah. you know go figure I don't yeah. know um yeah yeah so what are you ultimately hoping the listener gets from this album um I mean it's really like in a way also a gift to my family um because it's 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 a life times work you know of keeping something like that up for so long and with so much love and care and dedication and 
also just ambition to pass knowledge onwards to a younger generation you know um so it's it's huge like i mean they've really known my parents um in in that village horp in in um switzerland so to this day when they walk around it's like ah oh, josef ah oh, marie you know so it's like they they created something very special um and i think for me it's like that it's kind of really like at the end of such a big chapter to yeah to 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 also celebrate the successes they had because i think with a lot of things they they go to end right like be it a business be it whatever an institution that needs to shut down whatever it's like it's not just shut down closing it's also like wow it's like let's look back or even when it's, a, it's maybe a brutal comparison but when a person passes right it's like celebrate break the life you know it's like not just obviously we're all sad but it's like that's you know it's like a lifetime of of a person that that you know lived through so many stages and I think that's kind of how I looked at it a little bit it's like uh this beauty uh, that that is still there and that it's in all our hearts and my siblings have that forever nobody can take that from us you know so yeah. it's it's amazing you know so let's go back to your childhood tell me about where you you've touched on where you were raised but talk to me a little bit about how music came into it and how that became your life yeah, I mean, it's not really something I really thought about it when I was younger, because it was just always there. Um, music was always in our household, like my mom plays the piano, she plays the accordion, my dad um, yodels to this day, he goes every Tuesday evening to a yodel rehearsal. Um, and my mom was also a classical singer, and she sang in a classical choir and had solos. Um, I wouldn't say she did it professionally like I did, but she did it to a really, you know, high level and whatever she could do with the time on the farm that was available for her. Um, and all my siblings play an instrument and they all sing and it's just kind of, you know, my brother plays the drums, the other sister piano, then Stephanie plays the guitar. So singing and music was just always part of it. So it didn't really seem like, oh, this is this instrument or this is this singing thing that I'm doing now it's just oh yeah sure let's sing together yeah. <laughs> you know and, and putting on the record yeah sure like I mean that's it was just part of daily life and we had sometimes on a Sunday just you know uncles and aunts coming over with my cousins and we just that was it like mom played the piano and we were like running around in the living room and you know making noise I mean it was just the way it was um and then, of course, we had like some yodel performances as a family um, and that, you know, at the beginning, I didn't really know what that means. Like now we have to wear this tracht, like this Swiss outfit, you know, like um, that you wear when you yodel and then you stand there and you yodel and it's kind of more formal. Right. So I just didn't think too much about it. But I think when it really started was when I was, I think, 15, I took my first voice lessons uh, and then with 16, 17, I think I started to sing like really intensely with, um, well, actually before that already, but just along with music. Um, I, you know, did some musicals, then I started to join bands. I was very, very active in Switzerland. Um, and I had a solo at school where I sang The Girl from Ipanema. <laughs> oh, nice. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a classic, but for some reason because that was kind of like the tune that I think made me realize how people react to my voice um I sang that and it was a whole school performance and at the end they wanted that solo to hear one more time right so and I was like okay that's interesting <laughs> so I didn't really feel that impact of my voice up until then um and I think from then on I took it more serious and you know yeah, looked into studying music and trying to put more music in my daily life, et cetera. So. So when did you kind of the the focus, when did it kind of become jazz centered? Yeah, it's funny because we have like not too many options or used to have not too many options at that time to study music in Switzerland. Um because it was either like classical or then, you know, jazz. <laughs> but that's the thing. Like, I didn't want to do classical. I knew that. 
but chess in Switzerland didn't make sense either to me. So I was like, I was in funk groups. I did rock pop. I did all kinds of things, you know, but, but studying chess in Switzerland, just, you know, and I did go to the chess school. I also studied in London for a year, but the chess school in, in Lucerne didn't really say much to me at that time. It's not that it's not a good school, but I just, my head and mind, it was just in a different place. I was not ready for jazz. But at the same time, I heard about Berkeley College of Music. And that was when, you know, somebody told me, well, you know, the tuition is insane, but, you know, you can try. And, you know, and I was just investing my entire time to just do fundraising concerts, uh, applying for foundations to somehow get me over there to do one semester. Um, and yeah, with all the work I did and day jobs and who knows what, I was actually able to to graduate from Berkeley. And that was that was quite something for me. <laughs> so who were influences? Who were some jazz influences that really swayed the way that you approach the craft? Well, it's not it's not only jazz, really. Like I, I just I'm not a big fan of genres. I'm not sure, sure if you can hear that with my compositions. Yeah. I, mean, I guess the umbrella probably is jazz. You know, that's what I also often say. Um, but yeah, I, I do love classical music, you know, maybe not back then, but I, I do now. Um, I love jazz of all kinds of sorts. I love hip hop. I love pop rock I mean it it just what it has to be I think and also a lot of world music that's also a funny term but like from what country right <laughs> it's like <laughs> there's so many um it just has to be good and it has to be music that's authentic and meant from the artists because you feel very soon like it's this like fake somebody trying to be in a role of maybe fitting into whatever another person, maybe the producer has told her to do in a certain way. So I've never been a fan of these kinds of things. And I feel you can hear that uh, quickly. Um, and you also see like um, how long can a musician or let's use the big word of an artist <laughs> actually keep on going, right? I mean, all these like Voice of America or Voice of the Netherlands or Switzerland or whatever, um, yeah, there's, there's sometimes really good singers in them, right? But like, then they maybe make one album um, and then what happens after, right? So it's like, I think being a musician is really, it's a lifestyle. It's like a way of living. And um, yeah, you see who, who is still there when they're like 40, when they're 50, when they're 60, when they're 70, yeah. <laughs> or when they're like, let's say a huge example, Vane Shorter, right? Yeah. So it's just, yeah. Um, yeah. Differences. So what was the first live show that you ever saw that really blew you away? Oof. I wouldn't remember a particular kind, actually. Uh, yeah, I, d I don't really have one in mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, what's a big one that you you watched early on that really influenced you? Well, one that was just recently. Oh, you mean early on? Oh, like... it could be any. It could be any any show that really influenced you. Yeah. I mean, I think the most recent one actually just now um, was Linda Fredriksson. She's a Finnish um, saxophone player. Um, that's, yeah, I would say an up, upcoming artist Um and just really profound compositions and very soulful playing and just with the entire band you can tell like they're they're together in in all kinds of ways yeah. <laughs> you know it's, uh, I've always been a fan of like yeah I guess there's something about like always trying new musicians and trying new sounds and like you know kind of like the Miles thing right I mean there's nothing wrong with that right <laughs> but yeah. I I do like to play with the same musicians because there's also a whole other concept of what you can develop with them and I think uh, as far as I can tell she she's played with them for quite some time and you can hear you can hear something in there which is yeah. beautiful yeah for yeah. sure so in this journey as a professional musician what do you like the best about it there's all these components of recording playing live promoting all of those things but what is it that you look forward to the most every day um 
I mean, of course, it's 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 playing life. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. I mean, there's always the studio is is like home. Um, I love being in the studio. I do really like that. Um, it's also because you can kind of create in a different way, and I like the fact that there's at least with my compositions, there's definitely something black on on white paper, but then let's see what else we can do. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. just like, a, that's just whatever. It's like just a technique, like you, you need something to go from, right? Um, but I'm a very oral musician with just picking up stuff or singing something and then it goes into a whole different <laughs> universe, you know? So I, I like to to do that also in the studio if one of the musicians has another idea like okay let's try that you know it's cool you know um yeah if it if it serves the music if it becomes better um if it improves then let's do it so i think there's a combination between being in the studio which is really like this being this little kid of just you know cooking <laughs> and yeah. uh, being all the time curious and like okay what else can we do and on stage of course that aspect is to a certain degree as well because i always have improvisation in there somehow um, with solos or whatever um but it's a little more i would say well it depends actually <laughs> uh, yeah it, it, it depends also on the show on the day um but yeah, it's it's probably a bit more structured. Um, yeah, I'm a bit maybe less flexible um, on on stage than in the studio. So, what's uh, the scene like in Amsterdam? How do you fit into it, and what's the scene like? It's too early to say, man. I'm I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, yeah. It's been two years now um, since I'm doing this back and forth, but. Uh, yeah, I came here when there was actually just like a three months lockdown. <laughs> so nice welcome. <laughs> um, so that sucked. And, you know, you can like obviously in the music world, you always have to network and that's how you get to know people and musicians. And then you get asked to sing here and there and whatever. And I think that whole ball of like rolling and that it's like, OK, here I have a gig, here I have a session is not yet there where I had it in Boston because I mean these things just take time to develop to build up relationships to to build up trust you know with each other so that you know like oh yeah I can just call him because I know he can do this yeah. <laughs> you know so in in Boston New York I, I just had my list of drummers for certain things I have bass plays I mean I have my own business so I, I really had a list like <laughs> you know so it was easy um, in that sense and uh, very convenient but again that didn't come from from nothing that came from I was there for 13 years right so in order to build that up so it just I gotta be a bit more patient I yeah. speak now Dutch um, and I try to really <laughs> somehow find my way in in the Dutch society but yeah, it's uh, it's not always easy. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I bet. Give me kind of a timeline here of, you know, where you started and where you're at now. You said you've split time between two cities now. Give me kind of a theme and a timeline so I can keep everything straight. Um, you mean since when I'm here? Or? Well, I guess so. You you're born in Switzerland, and then when when okay. you went to bought when you went to school, and kind of where sure. we're at now to kind of yeah, keep it yeah. straight. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was born in Switzerland, then I, the first time I think I, you know, studied abroad was between 2004 and five, that was in London for one year, I did like a vocal tech school, um, then after that I went back to Switzerland, uh, 2005 until 2008, studied there at the chair school, but that's the part I didn't like so much. And then, you know, tried fundraising for Berkeley. Then I went to Berkeley 2008 until 2010 when I graduated. Then I moved to New York for a year. I worked as a waitress at the Blue Note. <laughs> Great time. Uh, uh, I'm back to Boston. Uh, I did my master's, but not uh, right away. That was actually just recently, 2019 to 2021. Uh, and in between, obviously, freelancing, building up my own business, uh, teaching at Berkeley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then 2021, um, yeah, it's Amsterdam, Boston. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, since we're more jazz centric here, I won't pigeonhole it that way, but why do you love music? What is it that you love the best about being a practitioner of music? Hmm. It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
because yeah the funny thing is there's so much you have to do as an independent artist that's not fun <laughs> and I wonder often myself like you know I mean you do know when the moment comes like that it's worth it but damn it's a lot of other work you have to do to get to this little moment of like it's amazing um I think yeah, I mean, I'm just looking back now at the duo gig I had with Maxime. Um, I think it's this this sort of thing that you feel on stage that maybe some people would call magic or spiritual or I don't know, like this big question mark of, yeah, something was there, something something happened. I, I felt it too, <laughs> you know, it's like, and yeah, it's really hard to describe, but it's just it's it can only happen when people are in the same room because you don't feel that like right now with with a Zoom call. Yeah. Um, there's just something missing. Um, and you know, voice being like a very personal instrument and a very how shall I say? Well, it's the instrument within you, right? It's in your body, so it makes a little bit of a difference, I guess you know, compared to like an instrument you have on the outside, um, you know, you really, you you feel the vibration of the sound everywhere because we're like 70 or even 80% out of water. So it's, there's a physical uh, experience you have when you produce these sounds um, because everything is basically um, moving, vibrate, right? Um, so I think, yeah, and we, we take a lot of risks together. So when you're on stage and you have a good band where the musicians are really sensitive and they really listen and all they want is good for each other and not that the other one fucks up and then stands out because he forgot to come in or whatever. No, it's all support. It's like, okay, there was a fuck up. Let's cover it. Let's make something else. You know, it's like that. That is what I, I feel like it should be in real life too. It's like, well, we should highlight each other's strengths and not weaknesses. It's like, it doesn't help. Sure. We have to look at what doesn't work and improve and become better, but we, we can actually do that really well. And I like that about American culture. It's like, no, you're awesome. Just go for it. Just do it. I actually kind of miss that here because it's like the Dutch people are very straightforward and then very, um, yeah, a bit rude sometimes. And it's uh, sometimes I wonder, is it necessary to say it that way or could it be done with a bit more love and kindness, yeah. you know? Um, but again, I'm just learning. It's a different culture and uh, still at the beginning. Um, but I think it's that it's it's this. Uh, yeah, these these very special moments that I think everybody feels like when it happens um, and hopefully, obviously not just musicians, because then then something is not working. Right. Like, I mean, it has to be. It's it's a I see it more like as a circle, like the musicians, they give a lot, but then the audience receives it and gives it back. So it's kind of a give and take. Yeah. Um, that's extremely, uh, yeah, fulfilling and just like, yeah, amazing. And yeah, maybe call it spiritual, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone wants to pick up the brand new album, learn more about any shows that you have coming up, anything about your history, where's the best place to go? I would say my website. <laughs> I'm going a little bit the Maria Schneider way. I mean, I have not the whole album on Spotify for that reason. So it's like five tunes, I believe, and just teasers. Um, and if you want the whole album, you got to buy it on my website. I have it um, also on other places. Uh, CD Baby, I think, uh, distributed it on some other places. But yeah, it's, um, it's the artist's page um, sure. that will be the best purchase. Yeah. Right on. Maybe, that, maybe make some money. <laughs> yeah, that's what I that's why I wanted to make sure that we got the right traffic going in the right direction. Gabrielle, thank you so much for your time today. Best of luck with everything. And I don't know if you know you have plans to come to Kansas City, but we would love to host you here. Oh, that sounds great. I'll let you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>